Hi, I'm Letha Savage. Welcome to Pathways to Progress. I'm here with your Portland City Councilors, Victoria Pelletier and Roberta Rodriguez. We're going to be talking about the encampments tonight and what uh, some councilors have been trying to do about that issue based on hearing from constituents and uh, trying to solve uh, the problems for everyone who lives in the city of Portland. And we are going to also be talking about the election coming up because this is our last show. Normally we have our show on the second Friday of each month and by uh, the second Friday in November, the election will have already happened. So we're gonna take you through the municipal ballot a little bit and the state ballot as well. Um, how are we doing this evening, counselors? How was your week? Oh, I've had a really busy week, and I think since last meeting, you know, we've been pretty busy, and we're we're gearing up for a, a meeting on Monday night, um, which probably doesn't seem as as uh, contentious as some of the more recent meetings and workshops have been. But um, yeah, it's been busy. Um, I'll I'll give you a little bit more context of what we've been talking about, but I want to say hi to Tori too. Yeah, hi. hi. <laughs> it's been it's been a really yeah, it's been a busy week. I think we're just like, we're right back in it. This happens every year now when we get back into like, we're starting to have our regular meetings again, um, starting to have regular committee meetings again. There's just a lot happening as always in Portland. So um, yeah, we have a we have another meeting on, another council meeting on Monday, the last one that we had last week, last yeah, Monday? Well, two Mondays. Two Mondays yeah, ago. Because we had Indigenous okay. People's Day. That's right, yeah. yeah. So we had a holiday, oh right, we had a holiday, so I'm a little off yeah. the time, I guess, but. That one was um, a lengthier conversation as well around the encampments, around shelter. And so it's it's pretty, we're working with some pretty significant issues. And I think we're all just like trying our best to really have productive meetings and also know that we're dealing with some just really, really challenging conversations for everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so in that last meeting, we had, um, we had a vote that we were considering a proposal to add 50 beds to the Homeless Services Center. Um, and that kind of proposal was um, in light of some of the recommendations that were made holistically of, you know, how are we going to facilitate our goal of housing people in the encampments. Um, so the vote failed, and my interpretation of some of the people that voted against it was that there wasn't some other policy, uh, uh, you know, change attached to it, something that would really um, aim at changing the outcomes that we're seeing from our currently, current policy. And so since then, taking that feedback from my colleagues, I started having conversations with the city manager um, and with other counselors about what does it look like to, um, to, to change our camping policy. And more specifically, to change the way that we're resolving the, the work in our encampments with sweeps and clearing of encampments. <clears throat> now, um, just to plant the flag on that, over the last several weeks, we've had work, two workshops at the council and this meeting where we've been discussing the encampments. And there's been a majority of counselors that have voiced their own um, uh, opinion that the policies of clearing encampments, that they disagree with it. On top of that, all three members of the Health and Human Services Committee wrote a letter <clears throat> that they shared with staff and constituents that clearly state that they disagree with the policy. So we've seen repeatedly over the last month, counselors speak in in, in the majority that we don't agree with that. So I started this discussion with the city manager to aim to get something in the agenda that would give the council an ability to suspend that policy and in essence suspend the sweeps. Um, and we started to make progress towards it. I got it all the way to where we were about to put it on the, or it was about to be posted on the agenda. And at the very last minute, there was a, a communication from staff that something that had not been mentioned to me all along, that as a result of the way that I was aiming to do this, uh, hazard pay would be kicked into effect because I would have been declaring a state of emergency. Now, unfortunately, nowhere along the process of me asking of how this would be done that was mentioned. So I felt like it was a really important piece of information that was kept from me. And then at the last minute, because that was something that I think would have really jeopardized the, the chances of this passing, I had to pull it from the agenda. Now, uh, through that process, I learned that the, the right path for the council to take to change our policy, um, we're aware of it now. Uh, we're working on that, uh -huh. and unfortunately, we won't be able to bring it in time for Monday's meeting, but I'm working with Councillor Trevorrow, and we're going to create an ordinance that aims to change the way that we're concluding our work in the encampment so that we stop the sweeps. And we hope to have that in the agenda for the next meeting, which will be the first November meeting for the council. Great. Knowing you as I do, I'm pretty sure that you also are part of the Let's Stop the Sweeps 
mm -hmm. uh, movement, and yeah. you're also on the Health and Human Services Committee. Yeah, I've yeah. been on the Stop the Sweeps movement since the movement has begun. My position on that has not changed, um, you know, and I, I, I think it's really interesting to look at it from the lens of like someone who is pro sweeping because we've seen displayed in Portland, the sweeping is not working at all. Um, you know, it's not only re-traumatizing our unhoused neighbors, but it's also just not a solution to the encampments. And we're seeing that very clearly. We had the Trader Joy's encampment, we have the Marginal Way encampment, we have a Harborview encampment, we have encampments all over the city, and we've done three sweeps now, two or three sweeps, and it has not gotten rid of the encampment. So I think for, for people that are very pro-sweep, I guess I'm just curious on like, what are, what are they hoping to obtain from sweeping? Because whatever the results are that they're hoping to see, we're clearly not seeing them. So I'm looking forward to um, Councillor Rodriguez and Councillor Trevorrow's ordinance and being able to look at the options of stopping the sweeping in Portland, um, because I just think as we've displayed since May, it just has been a really unsuccessful route in terms of trying to eliminate the encampments. And I also think we owe it to our entire community, our unhoused and house community to really look at a lot of policy work through this to ensure that we're doing, one, that we're aligning with our goals, and two, that we're actually making sure that we're looking at this from a systemic lens and not just saying like sweep, 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 and hoping that that solves the problem because it's clearly not working. Okay. Didn't you have a constituent tell you, well, you put them there, meaning you being the council or the city government and uh, there being the marginal way encampment, you were like, well, who did I put there? And they said, well, you swept that encampment and now they're all over here. like. Duh. Exactly. Yes, that's how, exactly. That's how it happens. Yeah. And, and, it's a, and it's a great kind of example that demonstrates how our own policies are kind of counterproductive to our goals, our stated goals. The goal of the ECRT, the Encampment Crisis uh, Response Team, is to house the individuals that are in the encampments. And they're doing that by going out there and interacting with them, right? These are providers. And I know as a clinician, as a healthcare provider, that continuity of care is the most important thing, right? Because it takes a long time to carry out a plan of care. Now, these providers, in essence, what they have to do is evaluation, plan of care, and discharge in a matter of days. That's not realistic. Mm -hmm. And then before they get that work accomplished successfully, we're clearing encampments. And if you lose contact with your clients, then all that is thrown. And not only that, but the trust that you've been building is broken. So all that is out the window. So now, if, if, the, if the purpose of clearing the encampments, and this is what staff has told us, this is what the city manager has said, the, the resolution of the ECRT works in the encampment being a sweep is supposed to be an incentive for people to accept the offers of beds at the shelter. So we're trying to incentivize people to accept offers of beds by threatening them of clearing them of where they currently are. That makes no sense and it's not working. And as it's a, not working. I, because just like you said, just like the constituent said, why did you put them here? We didn't. And then he pointed out, well, when you clear Four River, they all marched over here. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. And you know why they all congregated in one area? Because our current policy that declares emphasis areas throughout the city has eliminated the options that people have once we clear them from one place. So in essence, we've created this, this we funnel people into one massive area and then we're wondering why they, we have these massive encampments. What do we think is going to happen when marginal way gets cleared? Where are they going to hang, where are people going to eventually go to? when all the other areas in the city have been declared emphasis areas. We're going to end up with a massive encampment. Tori, take a wild guess where these people are going to end up. Um, probably Harborview. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's one of those things, too, I think, where, yeah, I, I, I'm wondering what's the, what's the end goal for this? Because if every location we have in the city is being swept and then designated an emphasis area, and then we still have a shelter as well that individuals aren't feeling comfortable going to, I'm just like, what's the plan? Like, what's the next step in terms of making sure that if every area of Portland is, emphasis, is an emphasis area where no camping is allowed, I'm, I'm very curious of like where individuals are supposed to go. And then it's like, are we going to start submit, uh, issuing criminal trespass? What is that? See, what are those things? CTO, yeah. criminal trespass orders. orders. Um, yeah, I, I just feel like it's, it's just not a solution. And yeah, Roberto said it best. It's just not working. It feels punitive. It feels like people are being punished for they the, are. the yeah. crime of being unhoused mm -hmm. um, is what it looks like to me. But let me also clarify. So would I be right in thinking a majority of the city councilors at this point in time want the sweeps to stop. They are against the sweeps. They've said publicly, stop the sweeps. Yet, the city staff will not stop the sweeps. Now, I know that the state also is planning a sweep November 1st. Yeah. And
city government can't control what the state does. But would that be a fair statement of the situation? Are most of you against the sweeps yet? I think uh, by assessment, at the very least, the a majority of councilors want to stop the sweeps at the very least for the winter, because we see it as, a, as an immediate crisis that okay. could just be exacerbated significantly over the winter months. Okay. So at the very least, I know for a fact. Now, now and, and just anecdotally speaking, yes, I think long term, there's a majority of people that, that would support a change of ordinance or a change of policy that eliminates the sweeps altogether. But at the very least, I know for a fact that a majority of us do not want sweeps to happen during the winter months. Mm -hmm. And when you say, what do, you, what do they want to happen? I'm guessing what they want to happen is people to cross the bridge to South Portland mm -hmm. or cross the bridge to Falmouth mm -hmm. or, you know, cross the bridge into West, or go into Westport. What they want them to do is like leave the city of, course. of Portland so that it's yeah. not Portland's problem anymore. Yeah, I mean, people hate when I say this because, but we're, we're turning into a city and I know people hate when I say that, but I just think this is, this is, these are things that happen in a city like Portland. And a lot of people are like, well, why, why are they in Portland? And why aren't they in like insert any other place? And then wondering, looking at Portland, like why, why do they have to come here? We have the, all of the resources are in the city of Portland and we're very lucky and privileged to be like a semi walkable city. So naturally there are going to be a lot of individuals that are here in order to the resources in order to get the, the things that make Portland so great in order to get the services that make Portland so great. So we are having some growing pains, I think, of turning into a city, getting more populated, diversifying. And I think with that are going to come things like this. No city is. I don't know any city in the United States that does not have at least one or two individuals that are dealing with housing insecurity at like the very, very least. So even the smallest, smallest, smallest city, you're going to have individuals that are still going to be dealing with oh, yeah. not having a place to live. You're still yeah, going to have. Egan has a big homeless. Problem. Yeah, I was just yeah. saying, which I mean, this is this is like this is yeah. yeah, this is something that people are just going to inevitably realize. Like it's it it. It is everywhere. Right. I mean, we just heard the numbers in Lewis, and they were they were making assumptions of something like fifty or eighty people that were on house. Come to find out, there's like upwards of like three hundred people out there on house. Mm -hmm. So they, mm -hmm. most people are clueless of how bad the problem is, and it is in small town Maine. You know, they 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 yeah. we have Poland has gotten so bad, and and the resources have been so dire that people are like, I can't even end up being in Poland because that's not even a safe bet. So they're staying in, in, in communities that have zero resources, zero support structures. Mm -hmm. And so if the consequences are dire here, now when we are who has had historically the resources to help people, it's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And our policies are exacerbating the problem. we got to change the direction. Well, I want to thank you both for working on this. I don't live in Portland, but people I love live in Portland. And I know that you have been very sincerely addressing this problem for a while now. And mm -hmm. you're not going to give up, no matter how frustrated you are, no matter how much they try to do the bureaucratic maneuvers on you. Mm -hmm. You're not going to give up. OK, we have about 15 minutes uh, remaining in our show, about half our show. So we probably need to turn our attention to the election. And um, le well, last time we did this, there were 13 measures on the <laughs> municipal ballot. This mm -hmm. time, there are several uh, candidate elections, right? But there's only one uh, citizen's initiative on the ballot. So let's start. Um, let's start with the uh, mayor. Obviously, uh, people have heard a lot about that. Uh, City Council District 4, 5, and at-large are up for grabs this election. School Board District 4, 5, and at-large are up for election. And the Peaks Island Council, four seats, that's an advisory board. Uh, those are all three-year terms, except mayor, four-year term. And then the Portland Water District also, uh, that's a five-year term. Did you guys endorse anybody uh, this time around? No, I, I don't ever endorse, actually. I made that rule for myself when I, before I started because I just think that it can get very complicated. So okay. I was like, let me just not ever endorse. So okay. it's nice to just, across the board, I just say, no, I don't do endorsements. Um, I will say I am very interested to see what happens with the council elections because we have that can drastically change the council. And that will be our last year, will be next year. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see in terms of the at-large seat, District 4, District 5, and the mayor, that is a, a significant amount that could change what we're doing as well. Mm -hmm. So I am curious to see, um, of course, who the mayor is because three of our colleagues are running, which has been really interesting to watch. I said that it's like, I, was, I keep saying it's like watching your coworkers try and get like a promotion and we work with them. <laughs> 
<laughs> great. So it's been funny watching the debates of just like people we work with very regularly. Um, but that will be really interesting. And then, yeah, I think depending on the district seats, I mean, I'm I'm just curious on how it's going to pan out. And I, I know that uh, Councilor Fournier is running for re-election, which I'm like really hopeful and this naturally that she wins her election. She's the chair of the sounds HHS. Sounds like an endorsement. <laughs> A soft one, yes. A soft one, yes. Um, I, you know, naturally we work together on the HHS committee. Obviously she's the chair. There's a lot of great work there that we can continue to do next year. And I think that it's it's been really nice um, having that committee with myself, her and Councillor Tavaro. So I'm, I'm hopeful in that regard that, you know, she will remain on the council as someone that I've now served with for almost two years. Um, but like, well, you know, we'll see. It, it's always really... It's always really interesting to, to see how the tone and the tide of the council changes just based on the election. So, yeah, but we'll be seniors. So I don't know. We'll see. Right. What about you? <laughs> Are you endorsing anybody, Robert? I, you know, what's funny. I used to have a similar kind of like not endorsing folks kind of self policy. And then a while back, I sort of kind of crossed the line mm -hmm. and I've never. Mm -hmm. But in this election, I've stayed out of it okay. for the most part. Um, there are some signs in my front lawn, but people forget like my wife. She also has her own preference of candidates, and often we disagree. So, um, hey, but I. Daughter, you have a daughter that's old enough. <laughs> yeah. To oh, care she, about who's and in she, office. she definitely has her her preference in um, certainly in the mayoral race. Um, I, so I, I've actually stayed out of it, and and it's been actually I've had constituents that have asked me, you know, particularly because we have three current councilors running, um, and I've said, you know, they've watched the forums, and mm -hmm. I said, you know what, just tune in to watch our meetings. Because you get to see yeah. them yeah. within the context in which they're kind of you know aiming to work at, and um and I've had them people say like what a great recommendation that mm -hmm. was so helpful, mm -hmm. and um you know outside because in the they've had forums like mm -hmm. almost every other day over the last like three or four weeks um if not longer, mm -hmm. and at one point I remember in my you know election they, they become almost like just mm -hmm. taglines that you're just repeating over and over again like you know clearly you're you're. You know, you're evolving in, in your in your stance and positions and your knowledge of, of issues, but at the, at the same, you're just repeating yourself. But when you watch us in the meetings, you really get to see the context of the work that we're doing. And by the way, let's remind viewers at home: you can watch recordings of the meeting, even if yeah. you missed that yeah. uh, city council meeting. You can go on and watch it. Uh, there's one citizens' initiative on the ballot. I think we're going to make quick work of this one. It is question A: rent control. Act to amend rent control. This ordinance would ensure that landlords who own nine or fewer units are exempt from rent control. Yeah. <laughs> Who's voting for that? I mean, other than landlords. <laughs> Did you both look at me at the same time? Um, yeah, I, it's, you know, that one, it, it's like, it's back again, I think, from the, the ballot measure that we had in the spring um, that was similar, but I'm, I'm still very pro rent control as one of the resident renters on the council. Um, that's not something that I'm going to be supporting. I also think nine units is pretty significant mm. um, in Portland. So I know that there was like some context about like these are kind of small mom and pop type of landlords. I still think nine Owning is Owning really, nine apartments nine in Portland is, is not pretty a mom significant and pop still. operation. Um, so there's, yeah, no, I don't think I'm shocking anybody with, with my stance on, on not supporting that. And right. again, I'm, I'm really hopeful that, um, you know, I, I love and need rent control in a city like Portland. And so do so many individuals that I represent in District 2 um, and so many community members. So I'm hopeful that we uh, can just enjoy having rent control without the constant need to amend it in, in any type of way. But yeah, it's not, uh, it's going to be a no for me on that one. Uh, strong no, obviously. Strong. Yeah, same thing, right? Like I've, we've talked in here, uh, so even in the like, election, last election as well, you know, renters are some of the most, uh, you know, in terms of housing, some of the most vulnerable people in our, in our community. Um, and, and, and rental protections and anything that we can do to protect them is, is crucial. So eliminating any layer of that is, is a, is a non-starter for me. So yeah, I'm a strong no. Okay. So people who are looking at their municipal ballot probably are not going to be terribly confused. They've seen lots of communications from the candidates and you've got one measure, do we, um, you know, kneecap rent control. Most people in Portland are likely to vote no on that. Um, we're going to move on to the state. There are a lot of these, and we only have about 10 minutes left, but I think we can take a minute to just go over the ballot a little bit. I already voted early in my town because mm. I knew I was going to be away on um, Election Day. And, um, but I have uh, uh, kind of put together a list of them, and I put them in roughly the order I thought was the most important. But something that's interesting, out of the eight ballot initiatives on there, 
five of them have to do with CMP one way or the other. Mm. That's crazy. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. So starting off with question one, this one I call the should we kneecap pine tree power before we even pass it? Because it's basically putting a huge um, obstacle in the way if uh, pine tree power passes. So people that want pine tree power and are going to be voting yes on question three are going to want to vote no on question one mm. because they don't want to, you know, hobble question three before it gets passed. How are you on pine tree power? Are you supporting pine tree power? You think it's a little risky or? That's question three on the state ballot. You know what's risky? My CMP bill every month. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, Every month, like, it's like, what happened? It's like, who left the lights on? It's like, no, this is, and then you, you review it, and it's like, no, it's legit. It's just crazy expensive. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it's worth, we need to, like, figure, it's just like we're talking about things that don't work. It, we have to, like, move into a different direction. And, and I, I totally understand, I think I understand a lot of the red flags that people are raising. But, um, yeah, I'm going to be a no on, on one and then a yes on three. Yeah, it's the same for me. I'm excited for Pine Tree Power. I'm hopeful that it actually, that question three does pass. Because, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. My CMP bill is regularly concerning. Mm -hmm. And I also just think, too, like the the feeling of of care and control and community feels like it is more centered with Pine Tree Power, of having it be local and, like, very main-centered in terms of, C like, in, in regards to CMP, which is not, I feel. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for the potential of what could come and I'm hopeful that it, that it passes. I think that there's, with anything like this, there's going to be significant opposition just because it's something new. Sure. I think people just don't want to, like, I think we maybe said this before, people just don't like change. Um, but I think that we need it. I think, especially again, going back to renting and being a renter and being on, uh, you know, significant limited income living in Portland and trying to, to balance how much it costs to live here. I think if we can have something that makes sense to all of us um, in Maine and especially in Portland and it is local and it's something where we feel a little bit more like we have control and ownership, then I, I think that that's great. So. Okay, so fingers me. crossed that three passes and one doesn't. Question two, another CMP-related one. An act to prohibit campaign spending by foreign governments and promote an anti-corruption amendment to the U.S. Constitution. This one is in direct uh, response to how much uh, spending there was on the CMP corridor mm -hmm. ballot initiatives where foreign governments were poor Canada, Spain, where the CMP's owner is, were pouring money into Maine's elections. So... I'm anticipating that question two will pass. That's very much of a main kind of, yeah, we don't want them telling us mm. what to do. We'll see. Uh, question six, stand with the Wabanaki. This one's interesting. The main constitution, when it split for Massachusetts, said, uh, and you will um, honor all the treaties that you made with the Wabanaki <clears> people. <throat> well, they left those parts out when they reprinted the main constitution and they've been leaving them out ever since. Who knew? Very so Molly and Dana, uh, Wabanaki Alliance, uh, um, Penobscot Tribal Ambassador has said it's, it's sort of um, just, uh, yes, it's not going to actually change anything, but it's a show of good faith mm -hmm. on the part of the state to say, we did say we'd honor our treaties with the Wabanaki. Look, it's right here in our constitution. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of hopeful that people vote yes on six. That's very interesting Absolutely, yeah. that it would be left out. It that is. One. Very, oh, quite what? interesting. Yeah. Question four is an act regarding the automotive right to repair. So can the big car manufacturers keep their proprietary software so that my great mechanic that I've been taking my car to for years can't diagnose what's wrong with my car? Mm. If we vote yes, then my mechanic and your mechanic and your mechanic will still be able to work on our cars. I'm guessing, again, Mainers, they're definitely. Oh, yeah. I think 100 so, uh, percent, yeah. My husband was shocked to hear that it did not include farm equipment the way it was written, because oh. in some states that have already passed such measures, uh, it has to do with farm equipment. Mm. Same problem. The computers are set up so you can't fix your own John Deere oh. tractor or whatever. But for whatever reason, that isn't part of the main one. All right, questions five and seven are both proposing amendments to the Constitution. Question five is another CMP-related one. It asks, do you want to extend the um, time that judicial review of petition signatures 
can take it right now the limit is uh, 100 days from the filing this one if this one passes questions uh, five it would become a hundred business days which is quite a bit longer than 100 calendar days. So it's basically asking, do you want the period of judicial review to drag on even longer? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if people will even understand it well <laughs> enough to know, no, I yeah, don't want it to no drag on longer. Mm -mm. It's a pretty confusing one. Uh, probably we're gonna, I'm going to vote no on that one. Um, question seven is a voting rights one. No, sorry, wrong one. Question seven is amend the Constitution. Oh. Um, Right now, the Maine Constitution says in order to circulate a citizen's initiative, you have to be a Maine resident. Oh, yeah. mm. And that has been ruled unconstitutional. A court struck that down. So question seven is an attempt to uh, fix that through a ballot measure saying, okay, we're gonna do away with that requirement. Interestingly, it doesn't apply to candidates. When I was getting signatures to get on the ballot, I had people out of state coming and mm -hmm. helping. It only applies to like people's veto and citizens initiative at the state oh, level. Okay. Hmm. Again, we're getting into the you know small details here. Um, question eight is about voting rights. Um, People that are under guardianship because they're living with mental illness, should they have their right to vote restored? Again, that uh, in Maine, they don't have that right to vote. This is not just anybody living with mental illness, but someone who has a guardian yeah. due to their level of, of disability with mental illness. Mm -hmm. And a court struck that one down also, saying that's not constitutional. You can't deprive them of their right to vote. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Again, pretty. Um, I was kind of disappointed to see one that's not didn't make it on the ballot, and that is I thought we were going to get to vote on the state flag. Hasn't there been a lot of talk oh, about yeah. that didn't make it, did not qualify? There has been a lot of talk about that. So to recap the state ballot items, number one, kneecap uh, pine tree power. Number two, ban outside money in elections. Number three, pass pine tree power. Number four, right to repair our own cars. Number five, time limit judicial review of citizens' initiatives. Number six is stop hiding tribal rights that are already in the Constitution. Number seven, allow non-Mainers to circulate petitions. And number eight, voting rights for those with mental illnesses. Huh? Busy ballot. Very busy Very ballot. Very busy ballot. Yeah. Boy, do Ma does Maine like, we've talked about this mm -hmm. before. Sometimes Portland's loaded up yeah. with them, but right. this time it's the... Uh, state ballot that's loaded up with them. Mm. I'm curious to see what happens. I'm the most curious, obviously, for the mayor and city council. So that's going to impact, I think, us most immediately. Of course. Yeah, um, it's, it'll, it's our, our senior year. It is our senior that. year. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be we'll your senior year. I, I might, you know, I, I'm definitely going to have at least one person, you know, because I have Councillor Diane next to me. So we'll have at least one councillor. That's right. One You'll have a neighbor. new person. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully April stays. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm hearing a lot of people say it's coming down to Dion or Pius or Dion and or Zaro. Or, so, those, you know, it's yeah. a good thing that it's a ranked choice voting ballot. Yes. So That's the spoiler effect handy. will not be, uh, you know, there is no spoiler effect with ranked choice voting. That's yeah, right. ranked choice voting, I think, is going to be really significant in this race because I think it will come down to who, who people put for their second vote, because I don't think any of them will no. probably get 50%. That's just a, so much, yeah, like no. nothing for any of that. It's just like 50% of the city is, I don't know that that's ever happened. It's, um, I mean, there's too many of them. There's just too, yeah, there's too many of them to get 50%. So I just think it'll be interesting to see who gets eliminated first and then where those votes go. Yeah. Um, and I think that will determine. I think they have to get 51%. 51, yeah. yeah. Right. On the first. Yeah. Even On harder. the first, which right. is like which is not, unlikely. yeah. Yeah, it's going to be, I don't, I don't, I don't oh, know, I don't make I any predictions no on that one, because it really could go. Could go anyway. Uh, yeah, and it's a major, like, elections, those, every four years, so people, I think, tune in differently to those than, you know, your at-large and district races, so, who knows? I don't know. Well, believe it or not, we're out of time already. Thank you so much, viewers at home, for joining us. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you for the Portland Media Center for hosting us. Thank you, counselors, for always taking time out of your busy week to do this with us. I'm Lisa Savage. Join us on the next uh, first Friday of November. And, um, you know, my last reminder is stand with the oppressed. Free Palestine. <laughs>